Hi there and welcome to the UK Asian. Uh, we're in London with an Indian comedian, a very rare breed indeed. Karthik Kumar, also known as KK, uh, was sitting amongst dozens of bags filled with 500 and 1000 rupee notes. He's come to London to get rid of it. Uh, no. Um, it's my only chance. It's, it's the only chance. Um, how, by the way, how have you been affected by that, by the way? Very deeply, tremendously. I feel like uh, I've lost all my money. No, actually not. We comedians, we hardly make money. We, we are, all of our payments are in, are in, um, are in like, US dollars, US dollars and, and pounds. And as an, as a film actor, I've been affected because most of the film industry back in South India is largely black money. So, <laughs> hey, film industry people, take that, yo. Um, right. So, first major country, a UK wide tour by an Indian comedian. Um, now, first of all, let's go back in time. You're an actor mm -hmm. who's made the transition to stand-up. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about your acting career, first of all, and why the transition? Uh, as an actor, I think you're, you're, just a, you're just a body, which means uh, the dialogues are fed to you, the, the uh, mind behind the character comes to you from the director, so you're just literally a, a medium for storytelling. And uh, at some point of time, as an, as an artist, I think I traveled, I wanted to direct stuff. So I started directing theater. And, um, and I'd, you get a little more greedy and you say, let's, let's, let's collapse that fourth wall that exists there. Let's, let's talk to the audience. Let's make a show that is seamless and that, that transcends that. And in 2009, when we did a theater production, which was just that, monologues to an audience, which, which starts becoming part of the audience as well. And we in accidentally chanced upon what is known as stand-up comedy. Mm. So we invented stand-up comedy for ourselves between 2010 and 2015, which is the, which is the story of most Indian comics because we have no points of reference. We're, it's not like we can watch YouTube videos of, of, of Seinfeld or, mm. or, um, or Jimmy. I got a minute. You, you've got YouTube in India, haven't no, you? We do, but, but the, none of that stand-up comedy works in India because it's, it's highly, uh, the contexts don't exist. And, and uh, when we look at British comics, they tend to be largely more subtle and dark, which really doesn't work in India. You need to be mm -hmm. a little more over the top and, and be as dramatic as Indian masala. So, so everything needs to be like a big Indian wedding. Well, uh, well in a way, without in the way. budget. Without the budget. <laughs> without the budget. So it wasn't, an, it wasn't an opportunistic transition to stand-up comedy because stand-up comedy is booming in India. No, it, I think we, we uh, the entire generation of first generation of comics in India are responsible for that boom that's happening now. Yeah. Because we were working for four years in dark rooms trying to make Indians laugh at themselves, which itself was um, a generational thing because people are like, how can you make fun of these things? There are so many holy cows in India, literally. And therefore, I, making sure that Indians get over that. And today, if you can think that Indian comedy is really in its booming phase, it's because we were tanking for four years in dark rooms. Mm. And, and what do you think has kind of, what's been the catalyst for that boom? Uh, is it the material? Is it people willing to laugh at themselves? What, what really has been the spark for, for it to come, you know, to really, really skyrocket in recent years? I think it's largely the young people who have, uh, who have made the art form almost like uh, as exciting as rock and roll. Because what was rock and roll in, in the US in the 30s and 40s, it was, it was, it was considered anti-Christ by the older people. All right. It was pushing the envelope. It was saying the racy, edgy things. It was it was poking into culture that nobody else was poking into, which is exactly what stand up comedy is doing. Mm -hmm. Stand up comedy talks about political and personal and social issues that the media cannot talk about in a society where a young people are largely being told by elders to not do things. You can't do this. You're not allowed to do this. You're not to say, allowed to say this. You wear these kind of clothes. Stand up comedy is the one disruptive medium which comes and says, be whatever you want to be. And we will, there are no holy cows. We're going to make fun of everything. So from that perspective, I think the young people taking to it like a drug and therefore the more offensive it seems to the older people, the more exciting it gets for the younger people. So... Mm -hmm. I think young people are responsible for all maniacal, crazy things like the Beatles and Take That and, and Backstreet. Take That Crazy. Wow, that, that's a first now in, in the UK. Um, but, uh, you know, material-wise, you, you make fun of everything from Article 377 to Indian weddings to gift giving, etc. Where do you, 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 you're mentioning your middle class upbringing, your middle class life earlier. Where do you draw your material from? 
Uh, I largely draw my material from things that that uh, give me a great source of pain and tragedy. You know, so it's if whether it's personal or whether it's political. I think you you first process that tragedy and you try and convert that into comedy because people are just waiting, writhing to laugh about something that's really paining them. Because if you laugh about it, it just unlocks that, and then it no longer torments you anymore. No longer because you've had that cathartic laugh. So I think the greatest comedy comes from the greatest tragedy. So. The more personal you dig in, I think the more cathartic it gets for yourself and the audiences. And and, and that kind of thinking that, for instance, the, the fact that, you know, Article 377, how it's affected a lot of really innocent people and, and how it's kind of suppressed a lot of people. And yet to be able to find the humor in it, um, is that is that a, how much of a challenge is that? Uh, it's a challenge because of the fact that Article 377 outlaws any form of different sexuality apart from heterosexuality all right so which means that you are talking something on stage which uh, technically is is supporting uh, an unlawful thing in my country so it's almost tantamount to supporting terrorism all right so from that perspective you will hear a lot of naysayers saying this is walking the edge this is wrong but as long as in your heart you believe that that all kinds of sexuality should exist because it's it's natural it is the way the humans were made and you feel very strongly about that as a human being. I think putting it out there is your responsibility. Taking, taking the brick bats, taking the trolls, taking the the political backlash of that is your responsibility as an artist. You just it's it's a it's a professional hazard. Uh, well, I mean, you you say it's a professional hazard, but that's not something that I'm sure a lot of comics in the UK or the United States, for instance, would identify with political backlash for saying something on stage. Um, I, I mean, what kind of experiences have you had in terms of backlash? Uh, well, uh, to give you an example, so there was this, I come from Tamil Nadu, all right? Our chief minister is, is a magnificent iron lady called Jai Lalita, all right? And um, so I was doing this, this set about Jai Lalita and her policies, which is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's critiquing her. Mm. And, uh, and at the same time, it's, 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 it's talking about something for it as well. So, you know, I'm walking the tightrope and I'm, and from a supporter of Jayalalitha, I'm probably, who's sitting in the audience, they'll be like, oh my God, she's, she's, uh, he's slaughtering a holy cow. Mm. Not referring to her size or anything <laughs> like that. Just, just holy cow as a concept. Yeah. All right. So I had in my third show after um, a third of that uh, tour, I had an entire eight to 10 carders of her party come and sit in the audience and watch the show because they had heard something. And at the end of the show, they came backstage and I thought this is going to be dangerous. That's and really sinister, <laughs> And they came and congratulated me because they did not know whether I was praising her or whether I was saying something nice or mm. say something horrible because I was literally walking the tightrope like a, like a, like a Shakespeare and jester. Mm. You know, I was being the clown. So they did not know if I was if I was for or against the entire issue, and therefore that's something that comics do very very intelligently too, so that they don't get caught. We always take the take humor as the as the slip out of a, of an issue. So we will take a stance, but we will say something acerbic or sarcastic or funny that lets us slip away from the issue. So hmm. you are walking that, and but then creatively, isn't that slightly frustrating? Because there are I'm sure issues. Um, relating to Jaya Lalitha, for instance, that needs to be critiqued in a funny way, yeah. that needs to be slaughtered. Um, I, I mean, creatively, is that not slightly kind of suppressing your creativity? Creatively, it would be suppressing if, I'd, if that material never made it to the page. Hmm. But it does make it to the page. I do perform it. But what I don't do, which is where I play safe, is that I don't put that clip online. Because once I, I put that clip online, then it's well, subject to all non-consenting audiences who just want to take the piss mm -hmm. at that point of time. So from that perspective, we we are careful in where we perform this material, but I don't think we are careful in not performing this material. We do let something that we feel very strongly about onto the white page, and then it, it gets performed. I, I, I find it interesting. You, you keep referring to yourself, the show, and, and what you do uh, as something that we do. Who, who's the, this we that you're referring to? I think we, I speak on behalf of a lot of my comics who are all fighting similar uh, battles in India right now. You know, we're all opening up markets, opening up uh, new venues. We're converting cafes, which were just selling coffee into stand-up comedy venues in the mm -hmm. country. So I think all of us in, in my fraternity back in India are fighting the same 
exciting war because we are opening up young people's minds. We are opening up avenues to the live performing arts in the form of stand-up comedy. And uh, it's a fun, exciting phase that Indian stand-up comedy is going through, which will never happen seven years hence because we would have done all of these things already. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's a... It's a fun fight. So it, from, a, from a cultural perspective, from a societal perspective, um, this is an incredibly important movement in that it's, it's more than the laughs. It's, it's much more than the laughs, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is much more than the laughs. It's, it's about catharsis. It's, it's about people allowing themselves to laugh at themselves through us. Mm. And that is mind expanding. That is every show that you do, you are... It's more about the audience than about the performer. It's about, did I unlock a lot of your mental synapses? Did I open them up? And that's just what we stand up comics at some point do. And very rarely as an artist, do you get to be the first set of performers of an art form in your country or in your culture, right? Stand up comedy has never existed before. Hmm. It was probably sporadic. Maybe there was Veer and Papa CJ doing that about eight years back. But in the last five years, it's just 400 comics who are like, fighting that battle in India in the last five years, and it will never be as exciting ever again. Mm. I mean, I'm, 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 it's, it's curious that, yes, you have... This is the thing. When I was doing my research, I didn't see the Jai Lalitha clip. Um, so you have, obviously, it's not online, uh, but you still do. Uh, you poke fun at Jai Lalitha. What wouldn't you do? Where wouldn't you go? Where wouldn't I go? I don't Jai Lalitha's colon. No. <laughs> nobody should go there. Yeah, nobody should go there. Nobody, nobody should go there. there. Nobody has gone there, I suspect. But anyway, um, uh, where wouldn't I go? I, I, I would go anywhere that I put myself through. And let's say, you know, most comics put themselves through experiments of truth. You know, what the uncomfortable truths that we handle and deal with ourselves is what we put out on stage. All right. So is there any place that you wouldn't make fun of yourself to an extent? I think... From that perspective, every comic goes through observational humor, then he gets personal, then he gets personal about his tragedy, then he gets even more personal about really ugly things in his own life. So it's only about what will the comic allow himself to talk about or not talk about. So if it's an introspective comic who's going through his seventh season or eighth season, you will see Louis C.K. right now in America going really dark and deep into really uncomfortable spaces. Mm. He talks about... Um, uncomfortable topics that are really uncomfortable for the audiences as well because he's put himself through that through that filter and he's really dug deep so it's only about how deep you are willing to dig inside yourself and as you get more and more prolific as a comic you get highly uncomfortable with topics that haven't been discussed that you haven't allowed yourself to discuss with yourself and then you bring it onto the page and and uh, again uh, uniquely i suppose uniquely Indian challenge is taking your comedy from, for instance, from the south to the north. Um, how, how do you, how do you do make the transition? Well, I think opening up North India for a South Indian comic is as much of a shot in the dark as it is to open up uh, United Kingdom for an Indian comic right now. Because you do find a lot of closed minds even in North India saying, hey, South Indians are like this. I'm sure they don't. You know, there is, it's that, it's that huge divide and, and it works vice versa, mm. right? So, which means that... The camera person's an author, by the way. <laughs> she is, she is. So, which means that my entire first set was about, you know, parodying North Indians versus South Indians. Okay. You know, it was all about discussing, saying, you know, North Indians know nothing about South India. And hey, let's face it, South Indians know nothing about North, North. India either, all right? So, it was all about that and therefore, that was, those were the, the that was the material that really opened up uh, a Delhi or a Gurgaon or a Bombay or a Calcutta for me because people are like how that is the most audacious no no South Indian because we thought South Indians are these really domesticated sweet puppy dogs or or little uh, herbivores which are coming out there but when we cross the line and we we make it as violent and nasty as possible through humor it really wakes up a bunch of a Punjabi sitting in the audience saying my god this what is this boy what is he saying these things and that's true and then you play, you play at both sides. You don't, you don't get North Indian hating. You get, you get actually saying, hey, it's about ignorance. North Indians not knowing about South Indians and South Indians not knowing about North Indians. So you play that very, very balancedly and then you, you win their love. So it's, it's, 
it is it's as difficult as as a comic opening up to united kingdom right now so and and now you're going to you you're obviously now the, the next challenge is um you know connecting with audiences globally you've just come back from an american tour yeah. um, how did that go um was there anything that really surprised you about your audiences in america uh 27 cities in america in 42 days so we barely got to see america we only got to see the auditoriums but 27 cities of which 25 were sold out and so that just gave you a feeling that oh my god the uh the the indian diaspora there the uh white americans are used to a different kind of stand up comedy watching watching us for the first time are curious to know about what's india like and stand up comedy is kind of the the greatest cultural ambassador for uh, for a culture that you've always been curious about the indian diaspora is curious to find out how india has changed are we like are they still like us or have we are we different from the india today and we are largely talking about um, uh, like current issues and in india and therefore that this stand up comedy becomes the greatest medium you don't want to watch a 2 hour documentary about india today you want to watch a stand up comic and and from what the stand up comic is making fun of you know that that's that's the real opinion in the crowd back home so from that perspective i'm very curious to find out what uk what what the uk and indian diaspora is all about and they will get to hear what india is all about from me i will get that dialogue happening during the course of the show and uh, people who are just fans of stand up comedy uh, whether it's um, british people who are who are used to a very different kind of stand up comedy will get to watch what is the indian version like and and you know something that you said earlier as well you're going to y- your routine here is going to be about gauging the audience and what kind of things that they respond to yeah. and then going from there over the next 90 minutes yeah, yeah. how does one do that i mean uh, you know my my idea of a, of a comic is someone who's you know written down the material yeah, yeah. practiced it in front of his bathroom mirror or whatever yeah. and then bringing that here but this is completely different well that would be the case of about 60 to 65% of my show tomorrow all right tomorrow and and uh, the days that follow in the store because 30% of material is something that i want to evolve from my discussions with audiences you know if i if, if i talk to audiences and i find let's say somebody has got a banking background i will crack a few banking background jokes back in india but i'm also going to find out what he thinks of some things that i'm going to ask him about and then there's going to be inherent humor and the moment at that point of time so i think 30% of the show will be will be jammed up by discussing with audiences but the remaining 65% of the show is largely my autobiographical experiences of being in the middle class in india and what is the mindset of a middle class person like and in finding out what the middle class of india is like you will find the soul of india because the india like gandhi ji said is doesn't live in its villages it lives in that damn middle class because we are the taxpayers we are the only taxpayers the rich don't and the <laughs> poor don't card. have a pan card yeah. and the rich won't and therefore we are the people who run that country and we are therefore the country is subject to like the british middle class that's that's who runs and votes and and does everything in this country i know country. that's who runs and <laughs> votes votes yeah it was a very interesting vote that happened recently <coughs> yes um but finally okay give us an example of a really crazy middle class experience that's turned into comedy gold for you <laughs> so i was trying to uh, contextualize the middle class to the to to uk people right so how would i explain the middle class so look at the monopoly board right so right from pass go to to kings cross station platform would be the lower classes because <laughs> angel islington to free parking would be the middle class right. because we have the jail right there in the center and the jail is something that we are also scared of you know the the upper class people keep going to jail all right and they get 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 out of jail free cards free because cards. they pay their way through and the lower class people are constantly in jail because they they're the easiest to put into jail jail serves as a reminder for the middle class saying don't ever go to jail in life <laughs> don't ever do the wrong thing and therefore you never do the wrong thing you never get rich in life all right hmm. and then we have free parking which we park our second hand vehicles in and the rich people park their black money in and <laughs> and then there is the upper middle class which is somewhere between the fourth the, that's the third row right from right from somewhere to uh, vine street i think strand to piccadilly right so in the third center of the board who are constantly trying to be like the upper class but yeah. the upper class are so bloody rich that these guys can never break they'll always remain middle class at some level and then you have the fourth line which is the up class which is right from right from jail 
two pass go because that's the so they have community chess there they have chance because they take chances they have community chess because they have lots of black money and all of that so you know i try and contextualize the indian middle class to a uk person using the monopoly board so i do this entire cool. eight minute bit on that so it's, it's i'm i'm sure it's gonna work <laughs> finally would you ever make fun of rajnikanth's hair mm, what hair <laughs> Good point. Good point. That was my first. Oh, uh, the, okay, would you <laughs> would you make fun of his, the lack of hair on Rajnikanth's head? I think Rajnikanth is as spiritual as as Gandhi, and therefore they share the same hairstyle. But when he does commercial cinema, you do want him to wear wigs because of the fact that hey, you don't take a man who's bald very seriously unless he's in politics. And you take a man with that hairstyle seriously? Because you you just you just paying tickets. You want to you want him to win an election, then he would go hairless, right? Which he does. He's a spiritual guru. Yeah, and a good man, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, a yeah. very good man, Karthik. So, give us a little bit of uh, uh, some some of the dates where you're going to be visiting in the UK. So, I start my tour on November 16th. It goes up to 20th. 16th would be. Um, Reading, 17th would be Milton Keynes, 18th would be uh, London Camden, 19th is London Wembley, and 20th Which would be... Which is sold out, by the way. Which is sold out, and Camden He's is... sold out also. Wembley. Yeah, sold out Wembley. It sounds exciting, doesn't it? And uh, Birmingham on Sunday, and then on Monday is my birthday. Okay. It is really my birthday. I didn't arrange it this way. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I head back on 22nd. Cool. Karthik Kumar, thank you so much for your time, sir. Pleasure, Richard. Thank you. Yeah.